My name is George Taylor. I'm a wildlife enthusiast and nature lover. We are on these beautiful bogs in the south of Leitrim. There's a, not a sinner about for miles. What I do is research for the wildlife. I do surveys for them on all the different bogs and mountains in Ireland. A normal day would probably be head off to the mountains, do sections of the mountain for insects, butterflies, birds of all descriptions, especially birds of prey. On, on the bogs that would be, more than likely I'd be frogs early part of the year and then the curlews come in then in March, April and we look after them, control vermin and stuff like that, yeah. When I was young I used to go hunting with my uncle Harry Beck and um, Packy Foley and we used to be ferreting rabbits, um, be after pheasants, poaching fish and so I learned a lot with them, them two people and I went from there then to Scotland and I worked as a gamekeeper in the highlands of Scotland and some of the some of the moors down in Yorkshire and learned a lot about wildlife down there and then I done a lot of research on different species of wildlife. In Scotland we were on the moors so that would be in the 70s, 69, 70s on and we'd be burning the heather for the grouse and um, you had the eagles on the estate, you had deer, you had salmon, salmon fishing and uh, yeah, it was a whole year round of control and vermin and that. And so I learned a real lot over there. So I kind of brought all that knowledge with me when I came home to Ireland. I used to go with a couple of people to be shooting grouse on the bogs and I took a great interest in the wildlife on the bogs from that, from watching them and how they respected the bogs. And I started reading a lot into it then after that and educated myself a little bit because when I left school now my, I wasn't great at reading and writing. Not the teacher's fault, only my own, from scheme and school. Well, the bogs nowadays, from, I can't blame the farmers or anything, it's just the way the bogs have been drained and the, a lot of the bogs in the west of Ireland are dying because of drainage. So, as we know that the bogs are a great asset to heavy rain here when we get it. You know, it holds back an awful lot of water. And now the water is just running straight out of them. Well, the, the importance of the bogs really is to, to stop floods in, in the rivers and that. To control, the bogs, the bogs always controlled the water. So the vast amounts of the vast amounts of the bogs, so they take in the water, but they release it at a small rate, that you know there was less flooding. But now they, they can't; the water just runs straight out of them, and it's causing flooding along all the Shannon Basin and all the places everywhere. Well, a lot of the wildlife now has disappeared from the bogs, and that's probably due because ground nesting birds have very little chance with the amount of vermin that we have in the country. Uh, vermin needs to be controlled. Uh, we don't want to kill it off, but it does need to be controlled. Like a lot of our birds are gone. Grouse, curlews are nearly gone completely. In 1985, I think, they done research on the curlews and there was just over 5,000 pairs and they done it again in, in, I think it was 2002 and there was only 106 pairs left. So, I mean, that was huge changes, but it's changing. There's a lot of insects disappearing and that, you know, even the, even the skylarks and, and they're all disappearing as well. Their numbers are gone way, way down. 
no, skylark. So, but that's that's the bird that flies up and makes the noise and he comes down again. Most farmers would know them. Around us here, we have um, most bogs are all covered by bell heather, but there's ling heather on the bogs as well, and sometimes we get white heather. And um, you know, that's they're they're the main ones. There's a lot of other small shrubs and plants that's on it. A small shrub, it's called bog myrtle. And the bog myrtle, a lot of the older people used to use it, they used to boil, boil it down and get the oil off it, take the oil out of it. And the oil is good for repairing your skin. But the main thing that they use it for, and they use it in Scotland as well, and it it's actually grows in Leitrim, the west of Ireland, it's a great shrub. But to use it for keeping away the midges. So if you break the leaves up and rub them in your hands and rub them round your ears and put a bit of the bog myrtle itself, break off a few of the and stick them in your lapels, keeps away the midges. Well, one of the, one of the rarest plants that I know is this sun sundew picture plant here behind. And it's it eats insects and spiders and stuff like that. Uh, it was brought in to Roscommon in 1906 from Canada and I don't know how far it has travelled through the bogs and that but I know that you get them in Lomford, Roscommon, Leitrim and it was a biologist brought them in from, yeah he brought them in from Canada in 1906 and in 1962 I was up on this bog and I came across these plants but there was only two like this one here and another one in this same spot and this is 2023 and here we are and they haven't spread spread that much as well what 50 60 years that's just the amount of them that's there so they're they're a rare but they're a non-native species like you know but it's a rare plant on the bogs. Well, the plant the plant feeds on insects. So, oh yeah, the plant grows and it has a, a cup at the bottom, and inside it to have it has this resin. You know, this and it's a chemical. Uh, there's a chemical smell of it, and it attracts, you know, the flies and, and whatever other insects, particularly spiders. They eat a lot of spiders. But that's what they live on. They live in actual flies, flies and insects. Well, you, usually at the start of the year, I, I, I go looking for the frogs mating. And uh, a lot of the frogs are dying on the bogs because of the drainage. So when the, when the frogs lay the, the spawn and that and the young tadpoles come out, usually if you get any bit of dry weather, them holes are all gone and them frogs all die. And they're dying in their millions on every bog. Now, in other years, we could get flooded out with water, you know. But uh, it's usually the frogs is the first thing we look look at in the spring. And then hares on the bogs. We have lovely Irish hares. They're a graceful an animal. The hares, um, they mate in March and they have three three to four leverets and they have them in different places on the bog and they go from one place to the other to feed them. They don't keep them together because if a fox come in he kill them all at one time. So they don't they don't keep them together, they separate them so their chances of maybe one or two surviving would be great, you know. And then skylarks and pipits and uh, then you have the curlews which is a big thing now because of them disappearing so we have to control the vermin in that's all around them like grey crows and foxes which there's far too much of as I said before I love to see foxes but you have to control their you know the amounts the same as grey crows you know there was always grey crows from when I was growing up but there was never the amounts that there is now I noticed big changes from when I was growing up to now that when the, the rabbits are dying off of myxomatosis and the condition of foxes and everything is depleted because there were, you know, rabbits is a great food source for, you know, wild animals like. And it kept 
it, 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 I would say that it would have kept the, a lot of the foxes off the bogs because they'd be hunting for rabbits, you know, it was a great feed. Like up in the bogs they had nothing to catch, only maybe a little nest or a curlew or grouse in the earlier days, you know. But now rabbits are nearly completely gone. I think they're gone down to about 30%. Like with mexamatosis and the brain, there was a new disease now as well that's killing them off as well. So that's made big changes. So it has, for me, the rabbits has made a huge change. All ground nesting birds are under attack from, from say, uh, magpies to grey crows. Well, from what we gather here from doing the surveys on the bog, early in the morning you'll see the grey crows will gather up. There could be 10 or 12, probably two families that have mixed and mated together. And when they're flying in the bogs in the morning, they kind of fly down the bogs and they're all looking and if they see something then they make a call and they're all over and whatever it is, it could be a dead hare, it could be a bird's nest, you know, and that's gone completely, you know, that's, that's the way they operate. I've been, I, like, my time of going for wildlife would be from four o'clock in the summer mornings and go home at 12 o'clock and maybe have a couple of hours sleep and go back out to the bogs then later on in the evenings, you know. So that's the time you see the wildlife. When we're all walking around, they're all resting. You know, they're not flying around all day, unless they're feeding young ones or something like that, you know. I'm involved with the Curlew project the last, I think about 10 years, 11 years. And uh, it's a matter of um, trapping the male Curlews in the early part of the year with, with nets and putting a tag on them. So we were able to um, we're able to follow the through the GPS. We're able to follow the curlew and see where he goes, and that's how you find the nest as well of the female. And that, that sometimes we we, tie, we catch a female and we tag her as well. But basically, it's the male. So they when they lay, then they have they could have anything from two to four eggs. And normally, when we find the nest through that. GPS, we put a fence around it and it, it keeps foxes out and that so they'd, they'd be the main enemy of them at that time of the year and the other only other one really we have to worry about at that time is the, the grey crow but they seem to be well enough a camouflage to protect themselves um, it's when the young curlews come out that are the most delicate, you know. Uh, they're more prone to vermin, especially when they're out in the bogs feeding. And I think that has a lot got to do with the, the demise in their numbers. They fly off when they're about six weeks. So once they're able to fly, you know, there's nothing more you can do with them, you know, to protect them. You use two cannons you use and you put a net, a, a net 20 meters across. And you put in a decoy, you put in a decoy bird. So you, you put this decoy bird in and you use a curlew collar beside the decoy. So this is before the nest. But once they're nesting, it's very hard to catch them. So the male bees more aggressive. So when you use a male caller, calling, he comes and he sees the decoy bird and he flies in beside the decoy bird to attack it. He'll walk around it, strutting his stuff, and uh, he'll come in and he'll, uh, when he gets to about a metre from it, then the cannons are set off. The two cannons are work on the ones, on the one line, like, so the minute you press the button, the two cannons go off together, and they pull the net out across the curlew. So the net is made of a, a material that can't damage them. So you go in and you catch them underneath and then you strip the net off and then you, you, you put them in a little bag and then you bring them off and then there's a man from Belfast, Kindrew is his name, and he puts the tags on them. Cuts a few feathers off between the two wings on the back, some of the, the bigger feathers, and leaves some of, the, some of the little feathers around the side and he puts a glue on, special glue, 
and then he puts the transmitter on, sticks it to that. And that stays on the board for um, about 10 weeks and then it falls off. And then we go and retrieve it through the, wherever it falls and that. So that's how we follow them. Part of our job uh, is um, controlling the number of foxes that's in an area and the pine martens, when we catch them in the traps, we relocate them about 16 to 20 kilometres away. And then we, we have to control the grey crows as well because they're in big numbers as well. The pine martens are, are under the government protection. So when you trap a pine marten, you, 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 you relocate them. But you want to be relocating them from an area, you want to be going 16 to 20 kilometres away. They do say 10 to 12, but you want to be going 16 to 20 kilometres away uh, and you, you let them off in a forestry somewhere else, you know. Foxes. Then the foxes would be the big, the, you know, well, they're a bigger, uh, I think they would be our biggest animal to hunt, you know, the fox. So he needs a certain amount of food, but the, most of the foxes are living on scraps. Very rarely you get, you get a, you get good quality foxes now like what we used to get. When I used to be trapping, at that time the money was for them before the band came in on fur. And I was, and we used to get foxes and they'd be, they could be from 14 up to 18 pound weight, you know. Foxes then, there was a lot of rabbits and so they were, you know, they didn't need to hunt the bogs. But they have territories of their own, you know, foxes. Even though they do cross each other and that, but they do have territories on the, of their own. We have the mink as well. Uh, it bees in some of the parts around the bog. They're not that terrible plentiful now as what they used to be. Because from what I've discovered in the last while is that otters do kill them when they're in the water. And I didn't know that until I met an old man on the banks of the river and he said to me, he said, you know, the, I seen an otter killing, killing one of them, them fellas, he says, one of them black fellas. And then I heard a few other stories about it and now I've come to realize where you have otters traveling up and down rivers, you won't have mink. It gives the like of all the small birds and, and other birds a great chance you know, and it's only done for the few months, you know, it's only done for the few, for the few months in the early part of the year. So like the grey crows have time to bring, you know, their young out and look after them. Same as the fox have, have their cubs and all that, you know. So we just do it in the early part of the year before the mating season comes. What I'd like to see is the bogs as soon as possible, getting them all stanked and getting them to regenerate again. Because a lot of the bogs are, are a lot of our bogs are all gone. And I don't know if we're too late with some of them. You know, but the likes of bogs like this, this is, o this is okay, but the, it still wants to, the big drains that's gone out of the bogs needs to be stanked just at the bog. They can leave the drain the far side, but stank it that the water can't run out of the bog itself. For, for what I, think is that I think it's up to everybody to, to look after our bogs you, you know or to do something to keep the bogs from draining out and that's the only message I would have to send to anybody because that's uh, what, what's happening is the bogs are naturally dying from the outside into the center so the insects you'll get on a bad bog you won't get them out there you'll get them all in where the bog is still growing and generating you know it's still living but you come out to nearly 200 metres or 150 metres out to the edge. There's no, the wildlife there isn't the same as the wildlife in there. It's nearly two different terrains. That's getting to be like a desert uh, where this is still growing. But uh, the, the, the government needs to be doing these little bogs. They need to be stanking them to save them. Well, for me, for the future, I just love to see, you know, the bog, the, the, all the outer edges of the bogs being all protected and try and keep the water back from flowing out of the bogs to try and regenerate the bog. <laughs>